Hello folks, hope you're having a good day. If you like what I do, the subscribe button is down below, the Patreon button is also down below to make sure that you are supporting the channel financially, but not only that, if you do that, you will be involved in the prize draw that is taking place on Sunday the 3rd of September. You will have a chance of winning £100 worth of free models directly from Composite Games to your house. Or, if they can't get it to you because you're living somewhere weird like the moon or Australia, I will send them to you myself. Either way, you will get your prize. The second prize is a Repulsor Battle Tank too, so if you're a Space Marine player, maybe you want to be involved in this one. To do so, become a member of the Patreon or go and become a member of the channel. Either way, you're supporting the channel in more ways than ad revenue and that means a lot to me. If you're getting any models over the next few weeks, make sure you go and give some love to Composite Games and use the promo code Northern Exile down below to get yourself 5% off extra at checkout. So, going into... I know a few of you won't be expecting a Hobby Nightmare today, you know? A few of you will be sitting there thinking, hmm, Hobby Nightmares? Isn't it usually a rant today? Well, no, because I have nothing to rant about right now. Things are going actually quite well, you know? Um, I have things on the back burner that I want to cover in... in in rants, Brad, I never really want to do a rant video just for the sake of doing one, you know? I, if I'm feeling passionate about something because something has happened, or I need to, like, you know, get something off my chest, then I'll do it. Definitely. But, in all other ways, it's time for another Hobby Nightmare. I am overflowing in terms of my mailbag at the moment, so it's time to do another Hobby Nightmare. Alright. Let's have a little look-see here, shall we? Matt says, Dear Mr. Northern Lights, okay, I hope you're doing well. I'm Matt, and here's the saddest and also funniest hobby nightmare I've experienced so far in this hobby. Before I get to the story itself, I want to take some time to describe one of its certain characters, because he's a rare exception to the rule that all Space Wolf players are a bunch of furry cringe lords. Okay, I don't I don't think they're all furries, right? But most of them are annoying. Sorry, guys. Sorry. This dude, Tom, is a 30-something walking stereotype of a Viking metal fan. Everything you've just imagined in your head is spot on. The long hair, sometimes braided. The beard, also sometimes braided. The black clothes, the band t-shirts, the Thor's hammer pendant on his neck. The leather van brace thingies on his forearms. Leather van braces on your forearms. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? You're not on a battlefield. It's 2023. You've just gone to Starbucks. What are you doing? Back in the day, I shit you not, he would even bring a wooden tankard to drink from, from during games. Uh, to be fair, I had, a, I had a friend who did that in university. Right, he used to bring a, a drinking horn with him when we went out drinking. It was cringe, but, you know, he was he was harmless and he was a nice guy. So, you know. But then he supposedly lost the tankard at some music festival. To top it all off, his surname literally means Little Wolf or Wolf Pup in our language. So, he was basically predestined for all of this. <laughs> he is the chosen one. Um, can you guess which faction he plays? Yeah, okay. However, this guy is an absolute gem because he has the gift of self-parody. He's not an over-the-top, mead-guzzling asshole, but sometimes pretends to be one to amuse himself and others. He'd shout and growl. He'd proclaim his moves like, My wolf guard will wolf onwards to wolf up these foes in the name of the Allfather. And of course, this would reach new heights when he faced a Thousand Suns player. A genuinely funny guy with a heart of gold. Not all of them are bad. Well, here's the thing, dude. Here's the thing. All the things you've just described to me are bad, in my personal opinion. Right? If you if you have a different take, or or person watching this, you have a different take. Fair enough. In my personal opinion, this is just as bad. This is horrible. I don't want the guy in front of me doing a wolf joke every two seconds. I don't want him in front of me shouting at the top of his lungs because he's rolling some dice and playing some toy soldiers. Stop acting like a five-year-old. If I would if I would be embarrassed to play you if my girlfriend was, sitting, was standing next to me, you're a bad player. Right? That's just, I, I, that's just how I am, dude, right? 
I, I get embarrassed. If, if I would be embarrassed, if you're a normal dude and you just have a laugh with the game and you want to play a narrative game with cool stuff happening in the 41st millennium, great, I'm for you. Brilliant. But if you're the kind of guy who wars and growls and shouts and beats his chest over a fucking game of toy soldiers, no, you're not for me. And most Space Wolf players are kind of like this. This is why I tend to come down on them like a ton of bricks. Even the nice ones do stuff like this. It's crazy, right? Those aren't good behaviours for me. And maybe I'm just a stick in the mud. Maybe I'm easily annoyed. But come on, dude. This No, come on. He may be a good guy. He does seem like a nice guy from what you've said. But those behaviours I would find annoying. I wouldn't play this person more than once. You know what I mean? I'd be like, no. 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 I, I'd, I'd have fun. I, I'd try and have fun. I'd try and make sure he had fun, and then I, because he's a nice guy, but then I wouldn't play him again. I'd just be like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good, dude. I'm not going to play today, you know? Uh, now to the story itself. Am I being too harsh there? I don't know. I, that's just how I am. Now to the story itself. The club is a long, narrow room with three gaming tables. Tom, the wolf player, is playing on the middle one. I am on the one nearest to the door and cash register. And on the far end are Laurel and Hardy. Yes, these were their actual nicknames in the club because, well, one was short and fat while the other was tall and thin. And they used to be best friends. However, you could tell their relationship was growing more and more sour and that evening we witnessed the culmination of whatever was silently brewing in the background and the death of a friendship. Okay, this isn't about Tom, okay. It's got to be in it at some point, though. It begins by Laurel making up some sort of bullshit about Hardy advancing too far in his movement phase. Hardy's not having any of it and starts cursing and waving a measuring stick tape in front of his face. <laughs> Laurel puts his hands on Hardy's models and starts pushing them back. And that's the last straw. Hardy gives him a massive smack Right across the nose with the tape measure. <laughs> Hobbyists are hilarious. Hobbyists are hilarious. As the whip crack echoes around the room, Laurel takes a second to recover or even realise what just happened. Then, he lunges at Hardy and they start to fight. Except neither of them actually knows how to fight. It's very probably a first for both of them. So, it's mostly a lot of shoving and arm waving. Yeah, handbags at 50 paces kind of a thing. At this point, we're all just yelling at them to calm the fuck down. But nobody goes to intervene. But then, Laurel breaks off and slaps a group of Hardy's infantry models, sending them flying off the table, bouncing off the wall and clattering off the floor. Now, this is a red line being crossed. And it flips a switch. Hardy's butcher's nails bite. He gets really furious and goes in with some real punches. But Laurel stands his ground and retaliates. They scuffle back and forth, bumping the table all the time. More stuff falls on the floor and you can hear the pitiful sad crunches of plastic being stomped on as they go. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. Well, okay. At this point, most of us start moving in to break them apart, but remember, they're at the far end. The room is very narrow, and you almost have to shuffle sideways around the tables. Tom the wolf by, is by far the closest to them, and since he's the larger-than-life viking figure in the room, we all kind of expect him to take charge and stop the fight. But oh, no, 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 no. Tom is actually busy, frantically scooping up his minis from the table into a tray with a look of abject horror that some harm could come to them. <laughs> As he was doing so, he rambled in his in this high-pitched voice along the lines of, Guys, stop it. This is utterly unnecessary. This is what children do, etc. But never looking around to look at the guys. So it looks as if he's talking to his models and not to Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> Oh, God. 
it's, guys, stop it. Stop it, please. You know, <laughs> it's just the best thing ever. Oh, no. Oh. Meanwhile, the guy Tom was playing has the bright idea to pull the entire table away from the fight. But the table is so heavy, he only manages to drag one corner. So the table is now placed diagonally between the walls and basically turns into a barricade, blocking off Tom, Laurel and Hardy from the rest of the room. <laughs> this is the most obvious thing ever. This is so funny. You've got two guys at one end of the room who can't fight. You've got a massive dude there who's, who's, who looks quite tough, who's actually just really concerned about his toy soldiers. And you've got another guy who has a bright idea, but because he's a nerd, he can't pick up a table. <laughs> so he's like, he's like Mr. Burns. It's like, <laughs> just like pulling it across the, across the floor. I love hobbyists, man. We're, we're all a special breed, but um, this is the most hobby thing ever. You know? Uh, like, there are several, like, all of you know, I, I, I nearly married into a Jewish family when I went into, when I went to America, and I, I essentially converted when I was over there. And even now, like, when my uh, old in-laws tell me a story about something that happened to them at a family gathering, I just say to them, that's like the Jew most Jewish thing I've ever heard. And <laughs> they just start laughing. This is exactly one of those moments. This is the most obvious thing ever. This entire situation. At this point, it's mayhem. Laurel and Hardy are quite seriously beating the shit out of each other. Tom is scooping up his models, and the rest of us are yelling at Tom's friend to just push the table back. <laughs> then, a sudden change. Tom picks up his last mini and thrusts the tray over the table to the other guy, growling, Hold this! Then he turns around towards the fight. The Canis Helix takes over, and as a true son of Russ, the Wolf Lord gloriously charges forth into the fray. He is taller than Laurel and heavier than Hardy, so it's like a giant bowling ball crashing into two mid-sized pins and knocking them apart. He then grabs both of them by the collar like they do in the fucking cartoons, almost picking them off the ground and proceeds to give them a lovely shouting to. And we all learn some beautiful new curses and colourful phrases. The two then just sheepishly stand there, wiping the blood from their noses and staring at the floor, chastised. And that's that. Of course, the owner immediately kicks them out, and they get banned for life, except for the next day, when they come to collect their armies, which in the meantime, all get dumped together into a cleaning bucket. Both the models from the table and the trampled debris off the floor. And that's the whole sad thing in and of itself. We never see Laurel and Hardy again, and Tom, bless his soul, gets really awkward around the subject and rejects any praise for it. But in my eyes, he was both a super nerd and a super chad in the same evening, and that's something you can proudly put on your headstone. Hope you like this story tale. Uh, love the channel. Wish you all the best, Matt. Cheers, man. Um, yeah, do you know what? The, do you know why he's kind of ashamed of of the, of the tale? It's because he doesn't want to be that guy. I know a ton of gentle giants just like this. Like they're, they're not, they, they hate people being afraid of them. They hate the fact that people don't want to play them and that people get intimidated by their presence. They don't like it. Because they're just big pussycats. That's just what they are. Right? They're absolutely just there to just enjoy a hobby. And the big softies. Until they have to use their size to, to, to solve a problem that nobody else can because nobody else can, right? And then they will do it. And that's exactly what this guy is like. That's why he doesn't want any, any praise for it. What a nice guy. And, you know, his behavior on the game aside, what a nice guy. Brilliant dude. Anyway, moving on. The Great Corvus says, Now, I've had an email from another Corvus who wanted to be called Corvus 2. So, these aren't the same Corvuses. Just saying, okay? All right. The Great Corvus says, Hey North, I'll get right into it. This story comes from my time in the Dungeons and Dragons hobby and revolves around a group I got together back in the day. I won't be naming anybody but myself and the two other main protagonists along with the DM of our tale. So, I've always wanted to try D&D. 
from back in the day watching roleplay on ItMeJP's channel on YouTube, I've always wanted to dive in head first. Yeah, that's not something that's get, that gets said a lot. A lot of people tend to give a uh, uh, critical role, you know, all the credit for getting people into tabletop, you know, roleplaying. Not for me. It was it me JP like this guy and a lot of other channels like that smaller channels that grew to about maybe a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, you know, subscribers. Um, they paved the way for people like, you know, Critical Role, who are all, by the way, professional actors and very well compensated for their time. So it's not as if they they all had a leg up. The other guys didn't. They're they're literally on on roll twenty and things like that. So yeah, good stuff. I met a girl called Claire online in 2015 and soon after after we were dating and she was introducing me to the nerdy parts of her hobby and her mine. I got her into 40k, well at least the kill team level games, and she brought me into the weird and wonderful world of D&D. Let me tell you, if certain playstyles are considered toxic in 40k, we have nothing on D&D. From power gamers to people with main character syndrome to unhinged creeps acting out their perverse fantasies. This is one of those latter times. My girl Claire found this friend. Let's call her Janine. As you tend as that tends to get used quite a lot on the channel. Okay, fair enough. She was quite butch, quite overly fl flirtatious with all the women of the group of gamers, of which there were several. Almost as if she was screaming, Look at me, I'm gay. Which is fine, you're gay. No one cares. Yeah. As somebody who's worked in uh, in bars and stuff, that does happen. Um, not sure why. I think it's this. I think it's like the lesbian version of the, of the of the overly gay person, like oh hello, and, and, and dancing around and stuff. You know, it's kind of like the the, the the female version of that, I suppose. But you know, you do no harm to me. You do what you do. You do what you want to do, as long as you're not harming anyone else. Yeah, have fun. She got a bit feely with the girls of the group from time to time, and here it is. Especially on evenings out, where the drink was flowing. A lot of them would humour her and dance with her and things like that. All I could think of was, if a guy was acting this way, he'd be out of the group by now. Yes, I agree. None of them would let her get too close, and she did upset a few eventually by becoming clingy and a bit weird. Yeah, if, if a dude acts this way, I agree. It, this is not equal, right? If a, if a dude acts this way, he's out of there. Right? Th those women are all like, "Oh my god!" But they're humouring this girl, and yeah, I, I've I've got a I've got I'm not going to name her, but I've got one friend who does this. She's gay, and she takes advantage of that all the time. The fact that women don't turn her away or don't act weird when she starts getting touchy feely with them on the dance floor, she she gets off on that. She loves that, but it's creepy. And I've told her it's creepy. It's fucking weird. Stop doing it. I know you can get away with it. That doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> Stop. Right? Anyway. She always had a soft spot for Claire. And when we finally started to do a D&D &D group, where me and Claire were players, we had a session zero with me, Claire, Janine, two other cool guys who were playing brothers, who were revenge paladins, and our DM. That's a really cool backstory for, for two brothers. You both revenge paladin, paladins. That's cool. So, at the start of the session zero, Janine announces that the group should agree right now to be polyamorous to help with romance choices. What? Girl has been playing way too many Dragon Age games, it seems. We disagree. She pouts. We move on. Jesus Christ. These are the... Um, these are the degenerates who ruin games for people. The reason why... Okay, quick five-minute tangent. Not even that. Maybe two minutes, and you can skip ahead if you want. But it's about video games, so stick around if you like video games. So, um, I'm going to be completely honest. The reason... We have romances and Bioware games now and role-playing games for the sake of having them there. But back in the day uh, of Knights of the Old Republic and Dragon Age Origins, those are the two best ones... Romances were a part of the game because they naturally occurred, even in Baldur's Gate 2. The romances that were in the game were naturally occurring things that made sense for your character to go on those journeys with those characters. And, to be fair, you could only unlock them by acting in certain ways, right? If your personality didn't gel 
with another character, a romance wouldn't happen. It was a very complex and nuanced system that I really liked. And in things like Dragon Age Origins, you could actually get characters using you, not the other way around. So Morrigan, for instance, she, of spoilers, she wants to sleep with you because you're a Grey Warden and you can have a god baby with her. So it's in her best interest to seduce you as quickly as possible. She is using you, and she comes to regret that if you actually, if the two characters actually do have a proper romance and fall in love, right? That's really cool. Like you're not, you're not the one pushing this forward. She is, right? In games these days, and in late, like later Dragon Age games, later Mass Effect games, even Baldur's Gate Three, I've noticed your companion characters are more horny than, than like you know, than a very horny thing. They're just all over you all the time. Because that's what game developers think needs to happen. They, they think everybody wants to have these ridiculous, you know, polyamorous, uh, sleeping with bears and foxes and all these other creatures of the, of, of, of the world. And all that. So they think the weirder they can do it, the more degenerate they can make it, the better for all of their players. That's not true. Right? That's not true. Romances being in games should add to the game because they naturally occur in the writing room, not because you shove them into the game because they have to happen to keep your perverted player base happy. Right? Okay. I'm not saying everybody who's into those things are perverted, apart from furries, you're all sick. But, um, <laughs> I love you all. I'm, just, I'm kidding. But, like, you know what I mean? I'm not saying if you're into those things, you're perverted. What I'm saying is, is that... <sighs> If you're going to have romance in a game, make it a natural, naturally occurring thing. It's kind of on the same level as, you know, making a character gay and his entire story arc is about him being gay. He's not interesting because he's gay. He's supposed to be interesting because he's interesting. That's how you write. Same thing with romances. And I, and I wish fewer companies would do them. And I wish the companies that did do them would do them in a way that actually aided the story and the, and the character development and the role playing because there are trust me there are a few in different games where it actually works there are a few in Baldur's Gate where it actually, work, actually works right even, even in Baldur's Gate 3 because I played a lot of it right but there are loads of times in Baldur's Gate 3 and the Dragon Age games and Mass Effect where you help out a guy once and he's like hey you want me to suck your dick I'm like no no I don't John just leave me alone right no, I don't. I helped you because you're my friend. Stop touching me, right? It happens all the time, and this is a symptom. This story, I'm telling you, is a symptom of that mindset of entitlement, right? I'm entitled to your romantic feelings. No, you're not. No, you're not. Stop it. It's creepy, all right? Do romances if they affect the game in a positive way and they come across by natural storytelling. Not because you have to have them in the game, because your degenerate fans will throw their dummies out the pram if they don't get their own way. Right? Cool. Moving on. The first few sessions of the actual game go by with very little incident. But Janine's tiefling character, a bard of course, is up in Claire's rogue business almost constantly following her around and attempting to woo her with different songs from her bard. Most of her lyrics are lewd, make little sense, and are basically fan fiction about her and, and Jane's, uh, sorry, her and Claire's characters intertwined on some sort of forest floor somewhere. Ew. This at the time is starting to grate on both myself and Claire. I am also playing a rogue who is a pragmatist and secretly is one of the is one of the children of Baal. Oh, oh that's cool. So you're an assassin. I like it. Claire is all over that shit. Yeah, no 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 wonder, man. Hey, Baal assassins are mwah, chef's kiss. We had not planned on being together in game, but the characters were kind of heading in that direction. We never consummated anything or put it out there, but you could tell they were banging off screen tasteful. Alright, I like that. That's cool. That's how you should handle it. That's how, you, that's how good role players handle it. If there is a romance, it's it's unsaid, right? It's unwritten. You can tell they're together the, the way that they act together, but there's never any, like, sex scenes or, you know, really weird shit like that. Because as a DM, I don't want to act that out with you, right? 
if I don't care if you're a man or a woman. If I don't know you, I don't want to act out a sex scene with you verbally, alright? That's not what I'm here for. Fade to black. Or, or do it do it in a way that I'll... Do you know what? I'm moving on. You're all degenerates. One session, Janine takes Claire to do some shopping in Waterdeep, whilst the rest of us are getting payment for a job from a local lord. Needless to say, Janine steals a few things and they are chased by guards in Waterdeep through the streets before finally the big bad of the campaign, a sorcerer in a nearby a hamlet, village and keep now knows where they are and has them captured by corrupt guards and brought to him instead of the local, uh, the local dungeons. He has them in his dungeons instead at his estate outside of Waterdeep and wants us to return an item stolen from him in an earlier session or, or he will flay them alive. Nice. Me and the Paladin Bros. <laughs> the Paladin Bros. Me and the Paladin Bros. Head on an epic rescue mission to this guy's castle as the girls try and get out of their cell. Okay. Okay. Every attempt to do so, however, by the girls is sabotaged by Janine, who weirdly wants to stay in the cell. She decides to use a song of seduction on Claire. Now... Our DM had allowed us to stockpile inspiration points if we wanted and to use it one after another in a splurge if we wanted. Hmm. Janine had 12 points of inspiration saved up, which are essentially re-rolls in 40k, and Claire had 4. You can see where this is going. Claire finally loses a roll-off and Janine ends up touching her character inappropriately whilst Claire fights to scream in game but can't because she's enraptured by the song and out of game claire is shooting daggers at janine in terms of looks luckily the dm deftly didn't come back to that scene and stuck with me and the paladin bros even when janine wanted us to return to the scene so she could describe what she was doing he essentially froze that scene in time whilst we whilst we caught up to the to the degenerate at the table. The bros went off to fight the big bad's henchmen whilst I found the girls. I locked picked my way in, subdued a few gu a few guards and got into their cell, only to see the scene had not really progressed. Thank you, DM. And Janine's character was just feeling up Claire Claire's through her clothes. Whilst Claire's character was smiling, we shared a bond through something called the Ember Shards. A long story, they were embedded in us like shrapnel earlier in the campaign, but we can now sense each other's thoughts. Help me, please. She reached out to me mentally, and I saw red. I took out my plus two dagger of spite and planted it into the base of Janine's character's skull. A kill shot, through and through. I rolled an 18, plus my modifiers of 8, and dealt enough damage to kill Janine twice or three times over. I looked at Janine and lied. I said, listen, I like you, I lie, but this character that you created here is done in this situation. My character would just kill the fuck out of her. I am an assassin of Baal, and I've just caught her molesting my girlfriend. She's deader than a dodo, I'm afraid. That's fair enough. You've explained it in a role-playing context, man. There's no getting out of that. You've done it the right way around. There's no getting out of that logic. You know, the only way somebody could try and get out of that logic is to reveal themselves as some sort of, you know, creepy, creepy person. Anyway, this did not go down well. Q Janine calling it bullshit that she was just dead, despite being warned there would be serious consequences for her actions if she kept pushing and being given several rolls to try to dodge my attack or survive it, which she failed or declined to use in favour of carrying on her molesting session. We ended the session and went home for the evening, with me and Claire getting out of the place with the paladin bros. We agreed not to discuss Janine's character anymore, and the DM invited her to do two things. Number one was to make a new character, and number two was to watch her behaviour at the table in future. Okay, that's fine. Dude, you all handled this splendidly well. I like this. This is cool. 
Janine eventually melted away from the group entirely to find new friends, and she did. But has only really grown worse over time, I'm afraid. Her online posts are rambling nonsense about the evils of men, the patriarchy and all that stuff. Stuff even her female friends seem reluctant to entertain her on. I would love to say this was a growing experience for her, but it was not. Cheers, Corvus. Well, maybe it's a phase she's going through and, um, you know, I've been told in the past that, that I'm a feminist and that's kind of weird because I think everybody should be equal and have equal opportunities and, th and things like that. Um, I'm afraid, like, if you identify with, with, with feminism in, like, the 50s and 60s, good for you. I do too. Um, especially go and watch something called Mad Men. Yeah, that's why feminism existed. That's why it was around, was shit like that. Go and watch the first episode of Mad Men. Yeah, that's why feminism was a thing and it was a force for good, right? Keynote there was not anymore, right? We're not the, you you either you either die a hero or live your or live long enough to see yourself become the villain, and that's what it is these days. You know, it protects people like this. There are good people in feminism, but there are a fucking shit ton who are like this, right? It's the same thing with Andrew Tate fans. There are a lot of good people listening to Andrew Tate who are just looking for some guidance. But there are really, really, really creepy people in there too. Who spoil it for everybody else, right? Who make who make sure that everybody who listens to that are put into a certain bag. And I do the same with feminists. I'm like, yeah, I'm the same. You just, you creep me out. Sorry. You creep me the fuck out. It's like being friends with a vegan and they've always got to tell you they're vegan. It's like, no, you don't. Not every single conversation we do has to be about politics. And not every single game we do has to be about politics either. Leave it at the door, please. Don't bring this shit into your D&D games. Don't bring it onto the tabletop. It only ends badly. You either kill off the entire table, or the entire table kills you off. One of the, one of, It ends one of two ways, right? People should be equal, no matter who they are and what they do and all that kind of thing. I agree, right? It's not always the, the healthiest place to be in a relationship, things like that, but I know, I know what you mean, and I agree, right? But on the tabletop, man, no. Everybody also deserves a bit of time to just relax, chill, and be themselves. And if you want to be this bisexual fox, fine. There will be a table out there for you. But to try and push your desires and your whims on everybody else... There was a guy back in the day called Adam Coble, right? I'm sure you know where this is going if you know what story I'm talking about. So, and so Adam Coble was an online GM, right? He would do lots of uh, YouTube things, and he's still on YouTube now. Um, and his games were brilliant. His games were fantastic, but he was very much he he was he was outwardly gay. He, he was very had pink hair and all that kind of stuff. He would talk about politics quite a lot and was very open and everybody should be free to express themselves and this and that and the other and things like that. That's fine. Okay, cool. Until one day, he decided, as, as, the, as the GM, as the Dungeon Master, to have a sex scene between his NPC and a player characters without consent. He took consent away from that player and forced that player's character to have sexual acts with one of his NPCs. Yeah. Yeah. Not great. Alright? Not a great look. And... Listen, I don't care what your sexual preferences are. I really don't. But, you know... And it's okay to play yourself in role-playing. It's okay to say my character's gay. But you can just have that in your own head. It doesn't need to be out there. You can just have it in your own head. Like, if I'm straight as a person, I don't come into a D&D game and say, oh, by the way, my character's straight. No one cares. No one cares my character's straight. Neither should they. Right? It doesn't define who I am. I'm not going to act out some sort of weird fantasy. Because, you know, I have my, I've, I have, I'm repressed in, in other ways. I don't do that. I've known real incels to be in D&D games, right? People who can't get laid because either they're, they're just not, they're not in that part of their life yet, right? They're not there yet. Where they're comf confident enough to go and get laid. And they, they don't do shit like this. You know? Every once in a while, every couple of years, I'll come across one. But the amount of stories I get where you see people just forcing their, their preferences onto other people. Just don't do it. Don't do it. The tabletop is a sanctuary where we all come to tell cool stories. If you want to come and tell weird stories 
that are, you know, in Vampire the Masquerade, where you know, you've got power over other people and it can get a bit creepy, that's fine if that's your table. But on a normal table, dude, keep it away. No one, no one wants that. We just want to have fun. We just want to have fun. All right. If you're gonna do romances, keep them respectful. Keep them nice. Keep them above. Keep them above the table, right? There's, I don't want to see players rubbing themselves under the table. It's not nice. Stop it, please. All right. And as a DM, if you see this shit, stamp on it straight away. Not romances. If people want to be in a romance, that's fine. I mean unsolicited unwanted advances that are masked by our hobby get it the fuck out all right love you a long time i will speak to you tomorrow we'll have some more hobby nightmares i'm going to try and get through as many of these as i can uh, so if you want yours read out make sure you send it in oh we've got loads tomorrow so it should be a good one love you a long time speak to you then have a good one bye